Another situation where we find a magnetic dipole. Well, who can tell me? Where else have we seen, or where else have you seen, maybe in previous experiences, a magnetic field pattern that looks kind of like that? What else produces a magnetic field pattern that looks like a dipole field? A bar magnet. Yeah, a bar magnet produces the same sort of pattern. And a bar magnet, so here's a bar magnet, and it's producing a magnetic field that at one end is kind of pointing away, and then it kind of spreads around, changes direction, points in the opposite direction here. And then at the other end, the field tends to point towards that end of the bar magnet, and again, it kind of spreads around and points in that direction. So this is the field pattern due to a, a bar magnet. And so the end of the bar magnet where the field tends to point away is a special name. That pole is called what pole? Is that the north or south? That's the north. Yeah, the north by definition. So the north pole, magnetic field tends to point away from it. South pole, magnetic field tends to point toward it. Okay, so that's a bar magnet. So we've all seen this, right? Here's a... There's a bar magnet, and I don't know if it's powerful enough to stick to the, eh, it sort of wants to, but it's a bit too heavy. There's a steel backing behind the, uh, behind the whiteboard, and sometimes you can get it to stick. But uh, we've all seen this. The question is, why does a bar magnet make a magnetic field that looks like this? I mean, is there, are there any move, moving charges here? Are there any currents here? doesn't appear to be. It's not hooked up to a battery. Uh, so what could possibly be making this magnetic field? Any ideas? The cent well, what's at the center? Or what's, in, what's inside? What's it made of? Uh, OK, so there's mobile electrons. There's electron C. But, so maybe electrons do have something to do with this. So what would the electrons have to be doing in order to make, they'd have to be orbiting. Yeah, they'd have to be orbiting. Where do we find orbiting electrons? In atoms, right. We have to have a situation where there, are, there in fact are mobile charges. There are, are charges that are moving in a particular way. There are electrons that are moving around inside the atom. So what will we have to have? Well, let's just look at a single atom. We have a nucleus, of course, very tiny compared to the size of the atom. We have a shell of inner electrons, which are all orbiting in such a way as to add up to a net Essentially, we say the net angular momentum is, is zero for the inner electrons. But for most metals, we have a single sort of outer electron, which we can model as orbiting the inner electrons plus nucleus. Okay, So essentially, it's like having a sing, just a single electron orbiting the entire atom, Okay, kind of like hydrogen, only we're kind of ignoring the contribution or saying the net contribution of all the inner electrons sums up to zero. So if you have a, let's see if we can draw this out. Let me draw this a little bit bigger. If you had a single atom, and in our sort of simple model, this of course is not an exact picture of what's going on, but just kind of a simple model to give us a sense of what's going on. Let's say the electron is coming, let's see, going into the board at the top coming out towards us at the bottom. So that would be the direction of the electron current. So the conventional current would be flowing opposite direction, right? So capital I would be coming out towards us at the top and going in at bottom. And so that would produce, if we had an, an electron moving in that direction, a magnetic field a dipole pattern of magnetic field, exactly the same way as we were drawing the field due to the 
the current loop before. Okay. Well, it's not just one atom. It's there are lots of atoms in this bar magnet, right? But essentially, what do we have to have in order to get a net magnetic field? What has to be true about the motion of those electrons? It has to be uniform. They all have to be lined up in a particular way, right? If you had one atom where the electrons are orbiting like that, and another atom next to it where the electrons are orbiting maybe like that, and another atom next to it with the electrons like that, and another atom next to it with the electrons like that, are you going to see a net magnetic field? No. Okay, so we must have a situation where, at least to a first approximation, we'll get a little bit more detail in a second, we must have a situation where all the atoms have their electrons lined up in such a way that they're all orbiting in the same direction, and then we say, okay, each electron produces a magnetic field, and so we add up the magnetic field due to all those atoms, and there are a lot of them, and we get a net, mag a net magnetic field due to the uh, motion of all those atoms, okay? And now we still haven't answered why there are certain, only certain metals that seem to do this, right? Only iron, nickel, cobalt, maybe a couple other rare earth elements. So it's certainly not a universal case that we can get this to happen all the time. But let's see, at least see if we can figure out Coming back to this idea, if, if I want the net dipole moment of the bar magnet, in other words, this, this mu factor is measuring essentially the strength of the dipole, how big of a magnetic field it's going to produce. If I can find, just as I had here, if I had the dipole moment of one coil, I can just add up the dipole moments or multiply by the number of coils we have and get the total dipole moment of the, of the coil. I'm going to try to do the same thing here. If I can find the dipole moment, magnetic dipole moment of one atom, and then figure out the number of atoms, I should be able to at least get a reasonable estimate for the dipole moment of the bar magnet. Okay. So let's see if we can work out the dipole moment magnetic dipole moment of a single atom. So let's come back to this simple model. Here's our inner electrons plus nucleus, and here's our orbiting atom, or orbiting electron, excuse me. And we'll say the electron's moving in that direction, some speed v, and that's a distance r. And we said that mu by definition, is the current times the area. Okay. Well, what's the area? Pi r squared. Do we know how big r is? Approximately, how big is r? So the radius of an atom. What's the approximate radius of an atom? An angstrom. Yeah, an angstrom is about... 1 times 10 to the negative 10 meters. Yeah. Okay. All atoms, roughly speaking, have about that size of a radius. Okay. It varies, of course, from element to element, but that's a, at least a rough approximation that we can use. What about the current? Well, the current is the amount of charge flowing per unit time. Well, how much charge do we have flowing? Yeah, one electron charge, right? 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19. What's the time that we're interested in? Yeah, the, the, the time it takes to make one orbit, right? The, so we want the orbital period. Okay, so E over T. Well... There's a couple ways we could calculate out the period. One way is to do it purely classically, and you could work out using the laws of mechanics 
how fast it's moving around if you know the radius and you know the electric force just based on basically uh, uh, thinking about the perpendicular component of the rate of change of momentum or centripetal uh, acceleration depending on how you may have seen it in your 205 class. I'm going to do a slightly different approach and use some, some more modern ideas of what we know about atoms. Let's say that, okay, the speed of an atom, if it's moving around a circle, is going to be the circumference divided by the period, so 2 pi r over t. And then the period is then 2 pi r over v. We plug that back in here, and so we have the current then being equal to E over, uh, or E times V over 2 pi R. And uh, then I can plug that back into our equation for mu. So I have the current, which is E V over 2 pi R. And I have the, rate of the area, which is pi R squared. So pi's cancel, one factor of R cancels. We're left with one half E V times R. Well, rather than put it in terms of the velocity, I'm going to use something I know about angular momentum. First of all, does anybody remember the definition for angular momentum? An angular momentum of a particle in orbit. Orbital angular momentum or, or uh, translational angular momentum, depending on how you've heard it. What does it depend on? Well, the angular momentum principle says that if there is a torque, the angular momentum would change, right? But we just want to figure out, if you know something's moving around the circle, you know the radius, you know the speed, how do you determine the angular momentum? A little review of mechanics. Okay, then the name suggests it might depend on the, okay, the mass. And mass and velocity make up, not force, momentum. Okay, so there's a momentum in this direction, a, a P vector in that direction. So angular momentum depends on the linear momentum and, okay, the distance, right? The distance, the perpendicular distance, right? That moment arm, sometimes it's called. And so here's a vector, R, that points from the center to the mass that's moving. And it's perpendicular to the momentum. And so the formal definition is R cross P. Does it look familiar to people? Yes, a couple of nods. Okay. All I want's okay, all I want's the magnitude of this thing. So that's just the magnitude of R, which is just capital R, the radius, times the magnitude of P, which is just going to be the mass of the electron times its speed. So let me say that V then, solving for this, V is equal to L divided by R times M. Okay? Plug that back into here. U is equal to E, one half. I have E, I have L over RM times R. So in fact, the R is going to cancel out. I have one half. E over M times L. So what this tells us is that the dipole moment for a single atom in orbit around, or a single electron, excuse me, in orbit around the atom, is one half electron charge divided by electron mass, those are constants, times its angular momentum, its orbital or translational angular momentum as it's revolving around the, uh, the center of the atom. Well, there's a special property about angular momentum that some of you may know, depending on, you may have seen it in 205, you may have seen it in the chemistry class, but it has to do with our modern understanding of the atom. And we know that in an atom, first of all, we know something about the energy, right? Energy in atoms can only, is what? What's the magic word? Okay, it's conserved, but it's also, someone said it, quantized, which means you can only take certain values, right? Well, that's true also for angular momentum. The angular momentum of an atom is quantized. 
And in the simplest model, this angular momentum is equal to just an integer times a constant, h bar. Does anybody know what that is? That's, that's Planck's constant. That's the, the Planck divided by 2 pi, right? So Planck's constant h divided by 2 pi. So this is Planck's constant. So this is a fundamental constant of nature. It's essentially giving us the smallest unit of angular momentum that you can possibly have. And it occurs in units of this h bar. And this number is equal to 1.05 times 10 to the minus 34. And the units are joules times seconds. So. Let's calculate out the magnetic dipole moment of a single atom, an electron in orbit around a single atom. So we have mu, uh, mu is equal to 1 half E over M. And if, it has, if, it's, if it's in its lowest angular momentum state, it's just going to have an angular momentum of H bar. So it's 1 half. The charge is 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19 coulombs. The mass is uh, 9.1 times 10 to the minus 31 kilograms, mass of an electron. We have 1.05 times 10 to the minus 34 uh, joules times second. Sorry, joules times second. Say again. Would the charge be negative? We're just looking for the, the magnitude of this thing. Okay, it's going to have some direction. Uh, we can figure out the direction to pay based on the orbit of the electron and how the bar magnets lined up. So let's just look for the magnitude. Okay. okay, so plug it in. What do you get? Calculate it out. Break out a calculator. Try it out. See what you get. While I'm doing that, while you're doing that, I'll get this word. Question ready? Nine point two times ten to the negative, what was the exponent? Twenty-four. Okay. Anybody else get something similar? Agree? Disagree? Look okay? Got it? Okay. Sounds good. What are the units? Uh, I'm not gonna go through and do all the unit conversion here, but we can go back to the original definition and see that the units have to be units of current. Units of current are What's the unit of current? Conventional current? Amps times units of area, which would be meters squared. Okay, so this is in amps meters squared. Okay. This is an approximation anyway. We're using a very sort of simple model here. So I'm just going to round this to 1 times 10 to the negative 23 amps meters squared. Okay. Great. We've got the magnetic dipole moment of one atom. How would we relate this to the magnetic dipole moment of the entire bar magnet? What would we need to do? What would we need to know? OK, so you need to know the weight and the atomic mass, right? Because ultimately, what we want is the, those things are going to give us the total number of atoms, the total number of atoms. OK, so here's a question. Here's a question. We estimated the uh, mu of one atom to be 1 times 10 to the minus 23 amp meters squared. The mass of the magnet is 13 grams. Okay, so this is approximate mass of one of these little bar magnets that you might see in the, in the experiments you're doing in the lab. So something that looks kind of like that. This actually will, will stick to the wall. Uh, and the atomic mass of iron, we will assume that this bar magnet, which is uh, an alloy called alnico, so it's iron, but it's got some aluminum, nickel, and cobalt mixed in. But it's mostly iron. We'll say that the mass, the atomic mass is uh, 56. How do we predict the magnetic dipole moment of the entire magnet? So there are some expressions there. See if you can work it out. Might be the best thing to do. Might be to try to work out what would how how you would calculate the number of atoms and then see which one agrees with your calculation. Okay, so we are converging to an answer. It's got to be answer five, right? 13 grams 
times the number of atoms in a mole divided by 56 grams per mole, right? So it's just a it's sort of just a unit conversion problem. If you want the number of atoms, you can say that it's going to be the mass, 13 grams. You have one mole for every 56 grams. That's what the atomic number means for iron. And then we can just convert moles into the number of atoms. So 6 times 10 to the 23 divided by one mole. That gives you the number of atoms. And so if you want that times the magnetic dipole moment of the entire bar magnet, you'd have mu of one atom times that. And so we get this all multiplied by 1 times 10 to the minus 23 amp meters squared. So work it out. What are you going to get? Calculate it. What do you get for the... Okay, so 1.4, and the units are amp meters squared. You get an ordinary looking number because you have a dipole moment that's on the order for per atom, that's on the order of 10 to the minus 23, but then you multiply that by the number of atoms in a mole, which is 10 to, 10 to the 23, and they, they cancel out, and you get a number that's kind of ordinary looking. Now, how can you check this? How would you verify whether or not this is true? What experiment could you do to figure out the, di the magnetic dipole moment of a bar magnet? What would it involve? Okay, let's calculate the field strength. How would you calculate the field strength of a bar magnet? With a compass, right. We've done this with uh, currents, so we could do this with a compass. If you had a compass, and let's say uh, ge uh, geographic north is that way, so it, if you just have a compass, it's going to be pointing in that direction. And then I bring, now there's a lot of norths running around here, but I bring the magnetic north pole of the bar magnet near the compass, what's going to happen to the compass needle? It's going to deflect, and it's going to deflect that way, right? So when I bring the bar magnet nearby, it has something that looks like that, right? I could then do exactly what you've done for homework a couple times now, measure that angle, use that angle to figure out the magnetic field due to the bar magnet, and then once we have uh, the magnetic field of the bar magnet, if we assume it's a dipole, we can say that the magnetic field of a dipole is mu naught over 4 pi, 2 mu over z cubed. But measure how far away it is. I've got the field strength. I could solve for the dipole moment. Okay, And this is something you're going to do in lab. Not, uh, let's see, next week. Yeah, I think you'll, you'll actually do this next week. And you should find, just you know, sort of keep this number in your notes and see if you find something that's at least close to this or all on the sort of same order of magnitude. So again, she's showing that the a very simple model, you know, microscopic calculation leads to something that we can predict and actually measure uh, in a simple laboratory experiment. Okay. Questions? Okay. Here's another question. You cut a bar magnet in, well, you cut a coil in half. So each new coil, so let's just think about a, a current carrying coil first. You cut a coil in half, each new coil has half as many turns as the original coil. What are you going to get? One coil with a north pole, one with a south pole, two weaker coils, each with a north and south end, or two coils that don't make any magnetic field when currents run through them. So yeah, you're taking you're taking a coil. Yeah, you're cutting it along uh, perpendicular to the axis, right? So here is here's the coil, and you cut it that way, okay? So just about everybody says, answer number two, two weaker coils, each with a north end and the south end, right? Because if I have just two separate coils, each with the same current direction, then they're both going to be producing 
dipole patterns of field, right? Of currents, capital, conventional currents going like that in each. You're going to have B pointing that way over here, B pointing that way over here, okay? So you can guess what the next question is going to be. Do the same thing with a bar magnet. You cut a bar magnet in half so that each new magnet is half as long as the original magnet. What do you think you're going to get? Okay, again, you're going to actually get two weaker uh, bar magnets because the model is it's behaving just like a coil, right? If we're imagining, if our model is we've got all these atoms such that the electrons are lined up and orbiting in the same direction. So there's one orbiting that way, and there's one orbiting that way, and there's one, and there's one, and there's one. It's just like having lots of current loops or lots of coils, loops, lined up in the same direction. So if you cut it in half like that, you just get a smaller number of atoms, each with those loops, uh, those electronic current loops lined up in the same direction. So I just end up with a magnet. One has a south and north pole, and the other one has a south and north pole with magnet, magnetic field pointing away from one end and towards the other end. Okay? So it seems like the only pat possible pattern we can get for a situation like this is a dipole pattern. What would a single north pole look like? If we could imagine a single north pole, What would the pattern of magnetic field look like around a single, single north pole? It would look like a point charge. It would actually look like a point charge, right? If we could imagine this, we'd actually have a situation analogous to a point charge with electric fields where the magnetic field is pointing all directly away from the north pole. If you had a south pole, the magnetic field would be pointing directly toward it, right? Well, so far as we know, this doesn't exist. No one's ever found a single isolated North Pole or a single isolated South Pole, or what's called a magnetic monopole. Yeah. And there have been people looking for them for a long time and doing particle physics experiments where they're smashing high energy particles together to see if magnetic monopoles pop out. And so one of the things that might be they might be looking for at the Large Hadron Collider in CERN is the presence of magnetic monopoles. But so far, no such luck. Okay? So if you find a pattern of magnetic field that looks like this, if you're doing a calculation or if you're drawing a magnetic field or something like that, you've either made a mistake or you made a discovery. Right? You just won yourself the Nobel Prize. Right? Uh, so, but, so keep that in mind. All right? No magnetic monopole. Uh, okay, a couple minutes left. I just want to say... Real briefly, something else about bar magnets. We said, so only certain types of materials seem to exhibit this behavior, right? Iron, cobalt, nickel. So what's, go, what's special about them that we can't seem to produce in other metals? So ferromagnetism is what this phenomenon is called. And it's actually a pretty hot topic of research because it's a highly quantum mechanical property. It involves really knowing a lot about the quantum mechanical behavior of matter at the microscopic level. But the idea is that if I, these electronic orbits, and really our model's a bit simple. We're talking about the orbits, but it's mo I think, I believe, it's mostly the electronic spin. So not only do electrons orbit the atom, but they have some inherent spin of their own, meaning they have some inherent angular momentum, sort of like a spinning on their own axis, if that were possible that contributes to this dipole moment. But if you can get these microscopic dipoles lined up, as we had, we can, you can produce a bar magnet. Well, I'm drawing arrows here that indicate the direction of these, these, uh, these angular momentum vectors or these dipole moments. Okay? Basically, it's kind of like the direction of the field due to a single dipole. And uh, it turns out there's a tendency in iron, nickel, cobalt, certain other materials for at short range, the spins tend to line up. The atoms tend to line up 
in what's, what are called domains. And so these areas are called domains. At long range, they tend to not line up. And that is because it's energetically more favorable to have you, if you even try this, if you try to place two bar magnets next to each other and, and line their ends in, up, so north is near north and south is near south, they'll tend to repel each other and one will flip around and they'll end up north, south, south, north. Okay, so over long range, there's a tendency for them to not line up. But for certain materials like iron, quantum, mechanic, quantum mechanically, they tend to line up. Okay, so you get these domains where all the spins are lined up in different directions, but they're got sort of patches where they are aligned. And so some are pointing one way, some are pointing the other way. And so overall, in just an ordinary piece of iron, net magnetic field, this produces a zero. Then you apply a magnetic field to this system due to, say, an electromagnet or a coil. And let's say the magnetic field is pointing up. So applied field. Well, you can get the... Re, uh, domains that have their spins lined up mostly in the direction of that field to grow. And so maybe this domain grows a little bit at the expense of all the others. And maybe this domain where it's kind of lined up in that direction grows at the expense of the others. And the other ones kind of shrink. Okay. So maybe that one grows too. And so now I didn't quite draw this very well, but it, you end up with most of the domains are kind of aligned in the same direction, and now it can actually produce a net magnetic field at a particular location. And then if you take this a magnetic field away, you can, in certain circumstances, cause these domains to sort of lock in and stay that way, and then you produce the permanent bar magnet. Okay? But it's susceptible to things like temperature. If you heat things up, if you heat the bar magnet up, you cause the atoms to start vibrating around, and then the domains don't tend to line up anymore. So it's a special property of certain materials that you can get this sort of lock-in and get this, these domains to line up in a particular way, uh, but it doesn't happen all the time. Okay? So you can read more about that in the textbook if you want, and next time we will start on electric circuits.